All right, so hi everybody. Uh, I hope you're not completely. Well, this is awesome. I hope you're not completely asleep yet. I'm uh, Dominic Ginner, and in fact, uh, since a few weeks, the CTO of a startup called Everything. And uh, today, I'm going to go. I'm going to go into uh, pushing um, data to mobile phones through HTML5 WebSockets. Uh, let me start a little bit um, talking about the motivation. Why the heck do we want to push uh, data through WebSockets to mobile phones? Well, that's a really cool question. At, at the time I started the project, I was still in academia. And in academia, actually, you don't care why. You just do it because it's fun. So yeah. that was the first thing I did. And then at some point, I uh, traveled to MIT. And uh, I was there, and I was talking to a guy from Walmart. And that guy told me, you know what? What I'd like to have is to be able to talk to those RFID readers, those heavy embedded devices. And I'll, I'll, I'd like to be able to create mobile apps that directly interact with these readers. Because one of the problems I have is, how do I monitor this reader? Every time I want to want monitor it, I need to send my staff in the back room, find a screen, find a way to hook up the uh, uh, the screen to uh, the data server and so on and so forth. So he was like, what if there was a way of simply building a mobile app that would get this data? A mobile app wasn't yet enough for me. I thought, what if there was a way to scan a tag on a reader and directly get the data piped? No app, just pure uh, website style, right? So I started to think, well, WebSockets would be cool for that because WebSockets, they are asynchronous. I could definitely monitor what's going, uh, what's going on in the reader. So the use case is basically when you think about very simple applications uh, that you want to use for monitoring real-world devices. In fact, this is my specialty, right? The, the company I'm working for, we, we build web tools for real-world devices. So we connect devices like RFID readers, sensor networks, phone bottles to the web. So uh, I <laughs> can tell you more about that. <laughs> so the idea is really, yeah, you scan it, and, uh, and then it runs, and then you have real-time push. So general idea, no app, uh, no installation, cross-device. Hopefully, some days, you'll see it's not there yet. Uh, it's so perturbating. There are so many screens. I don't know where to look. I'll just look at you. <laughs> and. Uh, and it's, not, it's lightweight, as you'll see, and it's almost real time. Actually, not really on my laptop, because I'm running two different virtual machines to run the, uh, the app, but uh, almost there. So WebSockets, what are WebSockets? Uh, the previous speaker was talking a little bit about it. I'll give you uh, briefly more details about that. So there is a problem on the web, and uh, you probably all are aware of that problem, is that the problem is that the web was meant as a client-server architecture. So as a client, if I want to talk to a server, I'll go like, hello, server, what's up? And if I want to know what's new, I'll go like, hello, server, is anything new? Hello, server, is anything new? Hello, server, is anything new? So you can tell that it's not really efficient, right? But that's the way the web works, for good reasons, actually. But people thought this is not optimal. So let's try to find hacks. We like hacks, right? Let's try to find hacks so that we don't talk to the server like a silly person anymore, and we get informed whenever there is, a, there is new data available. And people have been doing um, for quite a while now what's called long polling. Long polling is also known as Comet because of the long tail, right? And the way it works is that you do a request on the server, then you wait. And then the server replies, and then you do another request. And then you wait, and then the server replies, and so on and so forth. So you never actually completely close the connection. Well, you do, but you reopen it. Then there's another hack called HTTP streaming, where you connect, and then you send keep alive. If the server doesn't support keep alive, you just send some data, completely raw data, so that the server doesn't close the connection. Well, actually, those hacks are very cool when you're in research, but when you go into the industry, what I realized uh, not long ago, they can actually be very bad. Uh, this is the 101 of how to do a denial of service uh, on a thread blocking server, right? Old school servers, which are still about 80% uh, of old servers on the web, they will completely freak out after a while because they open a thread for a, a 
every connection. And if you keep them, they expect you to close it, right? That's what they hope. They hope you, you know how to talk web. But as a matter of fact, if you do long polling, you don't talk web, you talk some kind of foreign language, and, 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 and the, the connection will be kept open, and at some point it will completely overload the server. Okay, so great engineers came with the idea of uh, web sockets. Web sockets is actually the holy grail. Uh, they propose bidirectional and full duplex connection on a single TCP socket. So you do not close the TCP socket and you do some kind of protocol upgrade. I don't know if you can see it, it's written very small, but the client goes like, hello, server, uh, I'd like to upgrade to web sockets, here are my keys. And the, and the server, if it supports it, will say, okay, go ahead, upgrade. And then over the browser, we actually keep the socket open and the server can, can push it to the client. There's a really good talk that was made at Jazoon that really sum, sums up all that. Uh, I advise you to, to look at it by Peter, Peter Lubers, who was actually one of the founders and one of the creators of WebSockets. I think he's working for Kazing, you know company called like that. This is what actually happens in a uh, Chrome browser. So you see you, you, you do an upgrade. An upgrade is fully uh, HTTP standard, and then you're ready to go with the web sockets. This is great. There's a direct support in the browser. Um, it's NAT firewall and almost proxy transversal. So it solves many problems, especially for us. Uh, we actually have to deal with firewalls and NAT, and those are nightmares. Uh, and, and it's beautiful, actually. Uh, you can write a client in nine lines of JavaScript. And I, I'm, I'm completely bad at coding in JavaScript, but that I can understand. And I think anybody here can understand, right? So. You open a connection, you have an event uh, that's called back um, when you have a, a new message. You can also uh, create an event that does something when, when the connection closes. And to send a WebSocket message, you see, uh, it couldn't be easier than this. So it's very neat, but there is a huge but currently if you want to use it. There is a very different browser support. So, so browsers are not all equals when it comes to HTML5 and, and especially to WebSockets. There are good reasons for that. Uh, people first started with those standards, like uh, the Hixie 75, and at some point some smart guy went like, hmm, wait, uh, there is a big, big, big security problem there. And all the browsers said, oops, and started disabling WebSockets until the next standard came. And then the next standard, some other very smart guy went like, yeah, but mm, eh, it's not great. So there was yet another standard and yet another standard. So, so you have this really uh, scattering of, of uh, different uh, standards and browsers support different standards. And servers also support different standards. So you, it's basically the jungle of WebSockets. If you look at mobile phones, that's what I was interested uh, mostly about. Well, there is only Safari um, for iOS from version 4.2 plus that supports it. Uh, Apple decided uh, never to disable it, so it's, it, it has always been enabled on, on the mobile phone since 4.2. Um, Android, Android, it was there for a little while and then went and, and will probably uh, come soon again. So actually, what if you want to use the mobile push today? And here I'm going to talk to Java developers, sorry. There, there are also tools, similar tools for other developers, but I'm a Java developer, so that's what I know. And uh, people who wanted to use WebSockets started to realize, okay, so we need, we need a framework that solves all those problems. And there's a framework called Atmosphere. I'm not affiliated by any means to Atmosphere. I'm just a very happy user, and you can find it here. It used to be part of uh, Oracle, but uh, the guy who led the project had the very good idea of uh, leaving Oracle, and now it's, uh, did I say that alone? Is it recording? Uh, <laughs> No, had the very good idea to make it on his own. So if you go there, actually, you are redirected to a GitHub repository. Um, what's really cool about that uh, framework is that 
it offers transparent deployment across uh, application and web servers. So basically, you write your code that supports WebSockets using the Atmosphere, Atmosphere API, and then you're ready to go. Then you can deploy it to any web server. <coughs> now, if you were awake, you would ask me, yeah, but what if the web server doesn't support WebSockets? Well, if it doesn't, actually what Atmosphere will do is fall back to another solution. It will automatically fall back to either HTTP streaming or long polling. So that means you can write your app and then deploy it to any web server. But then there is a problem, right? How about web browsers that are consuming those web sockets? Same thing here. You have a jQuery Atmosphere plugin that enables portable web push um, on any type of client mobile client, desktop client, so browser. I'm talking about browsers, right? And it offers the, this transparent usage across all the browsers, and the way it does it is the same. So it will try first to initiate a WebSocket. If, it's, if it's, it sees that the web browser doesn't support WebSocket, it will try HTTP streaming, and then uh, last hope, it will try a uh, Comet. Okay, uh, let's get our hands dirty and then and start coding. Um, do you want to see it on slides or do you want to see it live in the code? Whatever. Live. Ooh. I like talking to developers. You, uh, yeah, that's that's another story. Seeing it work is going to be more challenging. Okay, so let me show you the um, the client part, uh, the server part first. Sorry. You'll see how trivial it is. Actually, I shouldn't show you that code because if I don't show it, you'll feel like I'm a guru. If I show it, you'll feel like I'm a newbie. But anyways, I take the risk. Okay, so this is what it looks like. Uh, I want to create a full PubSub uh, server that enables WebSocket, long polling, uh, HTTP streaming, and all that in uh, 44 lines of code. And Java mm -hmm. is very verbose. So basically what I have at first is I have a, um, a method that lets me subscribe to WebSocket. And then, by the way, this is using the Jersey uh, framework. I don't know if you know it. It's a, it's, a, it's a Java framework for doing very cool RESTful application, and it's also a standard. And then if I want to publish, that's all I have to do. So I, I, I then return a broadcastable object, and the framework will take care of sending this broadcastable object over the right channel depending on uh, that's the train. depending on how the server works. From a client point of view, um, it's also very easy. So what I'll do here is a, as a mobile client um, that uses um, Sencha Touch. And if I look here. Sorry, I should have done that before. So I've done that a long while ago. Right here. You feel like this guy is totally not prepared, but in fact, I prepared the whole day because of some like crazy bugs in the new Chrome version, so I didn't have time to look at the code then. Um, where is that? Okay, I'm getting super nervous now. There is a place where I can see my uh, subscription. Oh, you feel like this guy didn't do the code at all. Actually, I did. <laughs> but it, there is my name in some comment. Uh -huh. <laughs> OK, let's think. EPC event, this is the event. That's what I get from the server. I'm getting so nervous. I can't think anymore. Search for name, that's a good idea. Yeah, but this is NetBeans, right? It's going to take half an hour. <laughs> um, there is somewhere a subscribe function. Oh, it's not. Ah, 
controller, huh? <laughs> MVC. You should have told me before. Okay. Does that work? And and ah, here we go. Here we go. I'm sorry. You know, the more nervous you get, the less you can think. So, okay, I tell the Atmosphere plugin, I want to subscribe. I give it a location. I give it a callback. It's up there. And then I say, well, you know, if you can do WebSockets, it would be great. But actually, if it cannot, it will just ignore my request, right? And that's it. Then I have to write my callback. In that case, I will pipe an RFID event to the mobile phone. And, and this is actually the RFID event in JavaScript that then I can use in my mobile application. Uh, OK, so if I do a little uh, demo, demo time. Um, first, let's do a, a plain old uh, HTML demo. So I'm creating here a pub sub topic, and then I connect to it. And since I'm using Opera, and Opera is great for adopting standards, you see that actually um, it worked with WebSockets. And now I can send something to this. It's some kind of a chat. I can send something. And um, see, I get it uh, as a WebSocket message. Now, if I open Firefox, for instance, and I connect Firefox currently, uh, in this version I have, uh, WebSockets are disabled. But you'll see that. Uh, you shouldn't see that. So I say hello. Hello, WebSockets. <clears throat> so I'll, I'll go like auto detect. I published a message and it's trying to use WebSockets, but if I do it again, it will go to streaming, right? So it will uh, not, it will fail with WebSockets and send it over streaming. And if I go back to Opera, Opera got it also over streaming, but can also send and receive WebSockets. OK. OK, so what we've seen there is that we can build a cross-server PubSub application within a few lines of code. And we can deploy it in Jetty, Tomcat, Glassfish, JBoss. Currently, it was deployed in, in, in Jetty. Uh, if I deploy it in Tomcat, it will work. But it will work uh, with long polling. <clears throat> now, um, I've also shown that you can build a WebSocket client using the jQuery plugin. And um, it's a few lines of code. Once you found the class that actually matters, it's easy. And um, I, I'm going to demonstrate now how we actually hooked up a real reader and piped information, piped RFID tags. RFID tags are little spies like that that you paste on products. Now you see what I meant when I say we connect products to the web. <laughs> and um, so if I approach it from the reader and I start my, uh, my application, I'm, go I'm going to show it in, in Chrome so that, uh, so that you see all oh, here. I'm just going to simulate it to see if it works. So I'm sending the message. It's also quite cool because you don't have to talk the, the WebSocket protocol in that case. You can simply do a post on the uh, atmosphere endpoint on your PubSub server, and then it will translate it into a WebSocket message. So if here I sent an event to my mobile app, and I have the, the RFID tag that I was simulating. Now this is all fake, all simulated, but if I do it here, it should also work. Uh -huh. So you're supposed to say, yeah. <laughs> Guys, I spent hours today doing that. <laughs> huh? OK, let, let's try again, right? Huh, thanks, thanks. 
and this is the, the tag that I've seen that can then be used in any application. Uh, actually, these things identify unique products, then so that means Walmart could then know what product actually went through directly. Okay, I'm almost done. Um, okay. So if you look at it a little bit under the hood, uh, when connect, this is, for instance, when connecting uh, with the same app, but this time to a um, Tomcat server. I deployed it on a Tomcat server. At Walmart, for instance, they still run, of course, old uh, Tomcat 5 type of servers. And you see that actually what it will do is we, it will create an HTTP uh, streaming type of connection. And whenever an event is seen, you see the, the awesome time that the, the client had to wait for the event here, 35 minutes. That means 35 minutes of sending dummy data, right? How inefficient. Bah, boom. Uh, if you look at the uh, WebSocket uh, version, so you have this upgrade. And then basically, yeah, you get the data pushed with, uh, in this case, 3 milliseconds latency directly to your mobile app. We, we uh, on top of that, we've built a, a bigger application for them. We have actually a mashup framework that is also uh, HTML5 enabled, and that lets you uh, actually create your application. So we give that to Walmart, and they can combine their readers, combine their uh, security webcams, and they're super happy because they can create this workflow themselves. What the workflow here is doing is that uh, um, whenever you detect a, a product that is read by an RFID reader, you actually go through our stack, then go through tpusher, and you will check whether the product was stolen or not. You can know that because they have a database that checks in and out products when they are bought. And then if it wasn't uh, bought, actually we will broadcast through, not actually not broadcast, but push through tpusher um, the events to all mobile phones of the staff members. So basically what the staff members get is the item that was stolen and a picture of the person that was stealing it directly <laughs> on the mobile phone. <laughs> and it works. <laughs> Somehow. <laughs> it's still a prototype. Okay, so what did we learn to tonight? Uh, except that I should have looked at my classes more carefully. We learned also that uh, Web push enables new types of applications. So you can think of also using it on the mobile web with frameworks like uh, Sensor Touch, Joe. Uh, at the end of the day, all you're doing is, is, uh, is web. Uh, so as long as you speak web in your language, you can use them. There's no installation. It's cross-platform. You can use it, for instance, for real-world monitoring applications uh, like this one. And I would, of course, suggest using it for short-living interaction with real-time requirements. So basically not for the app that they're using every day for monitoring readers, but for a flexible app that lets them from time to time interact with the readers, for instance. Unfortunately, HTML5 WebSockets are not quite there yet. Um, there's a wide, wide support in the web galaxy, so you have lots of web servers that are currently implementing all the WebSocket standards. Uh, you have Node.js, you have uh, tools like Socket.io that is basically atmosphere but not in the Java world. Um, you have Pusher App, which is also a, a WebSocket server that lets you uh, consume WebSockets um, independently of your language. And you have uh, emerging support in Java Galaxy also, like Glassfish, Grizzly, Jetty. And if you use Atmosphere and the jQuery plugin, you can actually have good client and good server portability. And also, it's, it's worth noting that um, WebSockets, they exist beyond the browser, the browser. It's actually very easy to implement the WebSockets protocol, except that they change every day, but it's, it's still <laughs> is easy. And you have, uh, you have libraries for uh, Android, so native Android apps for Java, for any language, basically. Okay, a uh, little bit of advertisement. So, yeah, I'm Dominic. Uh, you, you find more about the research part of everything on the Web of Things blog. It's a blog where we talk about connecting things to the web, building embedded web servers. And we are also hiring. So if you're good and if you're a web developer or uh, have some experience in embedded uh, 
development, we're very interested to talk to you. All right, thanks. So any questions? Can you tell me a little about what's happening under the hood of the web server, uh, web sockets? It's probably TCP IP connection, and from your experience, how does it behave in a mobile environment where the user loses his connection sometimes, maybe he's in a Wi-Fi connection, Can then go goes now? somewhere else, uh, <laughs> is a question I didn't UMTS want. connection, goes back to a different Wi-Fi network. Will yeah. that connection still be there? Um, um, from your experience, <laughs> what do you experience? So yeah, that, that's definitely a problem. I mean, um, my experience is that what you'll experience is uh, different delays, right? Um, but it will work. Also, the um, the atmosphere plugin will uh, re re-establish the connection in case it's broken. So it has a lot of, of um, tooling like that that helps you. But obviously, it's not the kind of app that would replace C2DM on an Android mobile phone, right? This, this uh, push mechanism of, of Android. But it's more like for short-living interactions, where, when you don't want to install an app, uh, I, think, I think you can think of good use cases there. But definitely not uh, as a replacement for uh, iPhone push or, or Android push. Thanks. Hi. Do you, have you tried also Socket I.O.? Do you have a comparison between Atmosphere and Socket I.O. in performances or functionalities? So unfortunately, I tried Socket I.O., but only at the Hello World level. Uh, it was good. It's also cross-platform, uh, also cross-browser, so not only, uh, um, <coughs> can, well, you can deploy it only in one server, actually. It's the uh, Node.js server, as far as I know. Um, I didn't use it that extensively because I'm a Java developer and the atmosphere framework was just more appealing. But what I use is Pusher app. So this um, it, Pusher app, they have an online service, right? You can subscribe and then send WebSocket through their servers without having to care about setting up a server. And that was, that was good. The latency was pretty amazing, actually. But they charge you after a while which I learned the hard way after piping hundreds and hundreds of events from my RFID readers. They just blocked it until I paid. <laughs> well, uh, thanks for the talk. Oh, I got two questions. Hello? Yep, thanks for the talking. I got two questions. The first one is, that, um, could you tell us something about load balancing the... Oh. Okay, load balancing the uh, sockets, is there a problem with that? And uh, when you have many web servers uh, that are behind the DMZ or whatever. And the second question is, uh, on one of the uh, previous slides where you had the stack of the technologies, there was one word said there, cloud. How does that relate to what you just talked about? Did previously? I put the C word somewhere? Here? It says EPC cloud appliance. Oh, yeah, yeah. And it this says is, public cloud. Yeah, yeah, this is branding. We Thanks. wanted people to buy our stuff, so we added the cloud keyword. No, in fact, it's a, it's a, so I'm, I'm going to talk first about the cloud thing, but it's, it's um, an appliance that we created, a cloud appliance that we created to specifically connect standard RFID reader and logistic applications. That's why it's called EPC cloud. It's running as an AMI on Amazon. And... As for load balancing, um, uh, I would say, unfortunately, we're not there yet. We don't have enough uh, data that is piped to uh, the EPC cloud to have to load balance it too much. Um, it's a very good question, but honestly, I've, I've never thought about it. So. But I guess, I guess it should be doable. We need to think carefully, but let's talk about that later. Um, one short addition to this low balancing thing. I know that I think HA proxy supports uh, low balancing on web sockets. Okay. So this should be doable. Um, my question is about the performance of this atmosphere framework. Do, we, do you have any numbers? How many concurrent uh, connections you have open? Or 
these kind of things. This, this strongly depends on the server you deploy it on and not on atmosphere. Atmosphere itself, I believe, is, is well written. I know the, the lead developer, and I think we can really trust him. I also looked at the source code. That, but that strongly depends on what server you deploy it in. And, and there I've experienced tremendous differences, like deploying it to a Tomcat 6 or to a Jetty 8 is a huge difference, makes a huge difference. Um, but in this case, will you configure Tomcat to use like non-blocking, um, uh, yeah, non-blocking IO, or is it do you separate between normal web traffic or web socket traffic? Yeah. So of course, if you compare a blocking uh, Tomcat with a, a non-blocking Jetty, Jetty is going to win easily. But um, if you do, uh, even if you do non-blocking versus non-blocking, you'll have very big differences. And I, it's out of my knowledge knowing exactly why, but there are big differences, so that that's cries for choosing carefully what server you're using. Gla Glassfish and Jetty, for me, were actually performing quite well in the Java world for web sockets. Thank you. Um, I want to know if uh, you've ever implemented the use of WebSockets within a web worker role, and um, have you ever used web, uh, sorry, WebSockets within a web worker role, and how the event capturing um, will work in case it, WebSockets aren't supported? Okay, so no, I never used it in a web worker role. Um, what do you mean, how, how, the web, how the event capturing works? If you have long tail polling, for example, how do you uh, recognize the fact that you've switched modes uh, from WebSockets so you can uh, end that worker thread? Uh, the, the whole point of the, Java, of the jQuery atmosphere framework is to make that completely transparent so you don't identify that you switch. Actually. The framework take, takes care of calling the callbacks, whatever method you're using. Okay. Does that satisfy you? Yeah, yeah, just, but um, I was wondering if you've implemented in um, <clears throat> just in native JavaScript any of those methods for, for capturing those events, those event types. I, I didn't really get the question. If in JavaScript you've um, ever implemented the web sockets and captured those events uh, inside of the, the web worker context. Oh, you mean uh, uh, not using, uh, not using yes, atmosphere? Yes, not using, uh, not using uh, jQuery. Yeah, no, no, I didn't. No. But then definitely, I mean, then you would have to manually manage the, this transition between Comet and WebSockets and, and HTTP streaming. And this would be actually quite sad because you have lots of frameworks that abstract that for you. So. If you were to use WebSockets in production today, I would definitely use an abstraction framework that switches back. And I okay. would not use WebSockets in production today, but soon. Thanks a lot. These were awesome questions.